Good afternoon. For me, it's a pleasure to welcome today to the Consulate General of Mexico. And we have a very interesting interview with Dr. Gerardo Otero. Let me, before beginning, to, to read a little bit about the experience of Dr. Otero. Gerardo Otero is professor of international studies at Simon Fraser University. He received his BA in business administration at the Instituto Tecnológico y de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey in 1975, an MA in Latin American studies, studies with a major in economics at the University of Texas at Austin in 1977, and a PhD in sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1986. Dr. Otero was born and raised in Torreón, Coahuila, Mexico. He taught economics at ITESM and sociology at the Autonomous University of Nuevo León, social anthropology at the Autonomous University of Puebla, and sociology at the University of Guadalajara. Dr. Otero has published more than 100 scholarly articles, chapters, and books including neoliberalism revisited, economic restructuring, and Mexico's political future. Mexico in transition, neoliberal globalism, the state and civil society. Food for the few, neo neoliberalism, globalism, and biotechnology in Latin America. Otero's latest book is The Neoliberal Diet, Healthy Profits on Healthy People, published by the University of Texas Press in 2018. His current research interests focus on the neoliberal food regime and its diet, trade dependency, obesity, and health, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, emerging economies, agriculture, food security, and food sovereignty. Uh, welcome, welcome, uh, Gerardo. It's really a pleasure for us uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you. I will just give a, a, a brief uh, resume about what does food security and sovereignty imply. The right to food is a fundamental human right. It is enshrined in a range of international legal instruments, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. It is more specifically spelled out in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which Canada signed in 1976, and it is included in various other human rights instruments. The right to food requires the possibility either to feed oneself directly from productive land or other natural resources, or to purchase food and include several key elements, such as availability, accessibility, and adequacy. Today, more than enough food is produced to feed everyone. Yet, nearly 690 million people continue to be chronically undernourished. Meanwhile, millions of adults are obese or overweight. These worrying trends coincide with the reduced availability of land, the increase in soil and biodiversity degradation, and the greater frequency and severity of extreme weather events. The impact of climate change on agriculture exacerbates the situation. And well, now we have been experiencing a, a lot of uh, the weather here in British Columbia has changed. No, we had the heat dome at the end of, of June. So we are really, uh, we have the wildfires right now. So we are really suffering what climate change can do. And this obviously affects uh, food security. Now, uh, I would like to start our discussion by uh, posing you some questions, Dr. Otero. The first one would be, how did you become interested in current area of research? How did it all start? Uh, well, I guess uh, uh, there's a long and a short story about that. Uh, I'll, I guess uh, I'll do an intermediary story. Uh, it actually started when I was uh, doing my undergraduate studies uh, in Monterrey. Uh, I was studying business administration, but I also started to do some work in um, uh, irregular neighborhoods of Monterrey where there were a lot of migrants from rural Mexico. 
And uh, one of the things I, I noticed is that um, uh, the countryside of Mexico was expelling a lot of people, so to speak, because of dire conditions in, in rural Mexico. So that's, that's where my interest in, in agrarian issues uh, started uh, because, uh, because of the manifestation of uh, what you might also call the urban question. And because I mean, all of these people that I'm, I'm referring to were mostly living in what you might call also marginalized areas of, of the city of Monterrey. And um, so I thought that in order to resolve the urban question, you also had to address the agrarian question. So that that's, you know, it all started in the 1970s. And I've devoted my entire career to, to studying mostly the agrarian question. I guess I never returned to the urban question. I think it's yeah. very interesting because the agrarian Mexico has a, a lot of story regarding agrarism, but uh, we still have pending issues to, to change and to attend the needs of our people. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you another question. What is the difference between food sovereignty, security, and self sufficiency and why is it important to know these con concepts in the historical moment especially when we talk about mexico yes uh i guess uh, which of those concepts is emphasized depends on the larger economic model that prevails at any given time so i would argue and in fact i have argued in, in an article and eventually in my book as well that the concept of food security was introduced uh, for the first time. I traced it to the 1970s, but it became much more uh, in vogue in the 1980s. And, and one of the, let me first say how that uh, was defined. I mean, uh, you already defined it, you know, according to, to the, the official definition of the United Nations uh, in terms of uh, accessibility, availability, uh, adequacy in terms of uh, you know the cultural patterns in each country there needs to be some cultural adequacy to that but the the concept of food security involved not only all of those things but the possibility of procuring food via trade because trade in the 1980s happened to be the one of the main things that were being proposed by the neoliberal turn you know, it was no longer fashionable uh, to, for countries to seek self-sufficiency. It was much better for them to, you know, try to concentrate on whatever crops they were best to produce, even if they were to be exported, and to import goods in which maybe they were not so good at producing, uh, and so, it, you know, the, the theory of international trade would argue that uh, these um, specialization, uh, according to comparative advantages, was going to eventually result in everybody's betterment. But the problem is, I mean, that was the theory, but the reality is different because uh, it so happens that, uh, you know, the countries are very different. They have uh, very different endowments. The companies that uh, do the international trade also have very differential powers, you know, to uh, peasants, for instance, right? So the weaker part in this whole equation were the peasants in the case of Mexico, because they used to be the main providers of basic foods, and with the neoliberal turn, um, they were exposed to direct competition to heavily subsidized farmers, particularly in the United States, but also in Canada. Canada's farmers are much less subsidized, by the way, than those in the United States. But in the United States, they're very heavily subsidized, including in corn, which happens to be the main staple in, in Mexico. So that generated all these massive uh, bankruptcies in, of you know, the peasant economy in Mexico that contributed to this tremendous flow of migrants 
uh, both to the cities in Mexico and to the north. And uh, I guess this, this particular pattern was reversed as of 2011, you know, when the net uh, migration has been more or less balanced. Yeah, uh, but, you know, for a couple of decades, Mexico became the main expeller of uh, labor force. Yes, I think that, well, we, we are still facing that, uh, that scenario now with the mm -hmm. pandemic. Obviously, I think more people will try to migrate because migration is part of humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I'm aware, and I was talking the other day to a businessman here, and he was telling me that, uh, well, he has a, a model that he would like to, to duplicate or replicate in Mexico, because one problem is that a lot of Americans go to Mexico, buy their crops, they are becoming inter intermediaries, and they are the ones that are getting all the money, but not the peasants. Maybe something that could be bought at two dollars, they sell it at ten. But the reality is that the huge income remains in the intermediary, not the the, the producer. Right. So uh, that's something that we need to address, obviously, to uh, to let people have a better income, and in that way, try them, uh, give them the opportunity, so they will not have to mi mi uh, to migrate either to the to the US or Canada, because I can tell you that lately a huge number of Mexicans are coming here through the SOP program, the Temporary Agricultural Work Program, to work here in the fields of Canada. And well, the, that sector, that economical sector here in Canada is quite important for, for its economy and also for its uh, food supply chain. Let me ask you another question. Why is the idea that we can solve the food crisis simply by increasing production problematic? Um, so I guess uh, solving the problem by, of, of, did you say of hunger by increasing production or? I mean, no, the, the, the food crisis, just oh, the food that, crisis. that we can produce much more uh, food and that would solve Solve the problem. Yeah. yeah, well, as, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of our talk, uh, uh, there is enough food to feed everybody in the world. So the, the issue is not really uh, one of food scarcity, but one of food distribution. And in addition to that, I, I, I mean, one of the things that I start uh, saying in, in my book, in my latest book, uh, The Neoliberal Diet, is that. Uh, Whereas until the 1980s, the main food issue was supposed to be food, uh, uh, inadequate access to food or insufficient access to food, uh, which I characterized as a quantitative issue in terms of uh, food security. As far as I can tell, and I mean, you mentioned also the fact that uh, there is a, a growing number of people who are obese. And I attribute that to the fact that the new food security issue has become not quantitative, but qualitative. You know, the, the fact that people are having access to a lot of calories, but most often the wrong kind of calories, because not all calories are made the same. In the sense that some calories come accompanied with a lot of fiber and vitamins and you know, other nutritious stuff, which is, you know, really necessary for the human body, but other calories that come completely empty of uh, nutritious, uh, other nutritious uh, elements like sugar. I mean, sugar is completely empty of uh, nutrients. Uh, all it gives you is energy. And uh, I mean, that, that's why it's a problem that Mexico happens to be one of the greatest drinkers of sweetened soft drinks, right? So I, I'm not sure if that uh, answers your question. No, yes, of course. I think, uh, well, and, and this has especially impact low to middle income classes. No, mm -hmm. I can tell you it's quite surprising to cross the border to the, to the UN, I mean, to the US, and uh, to see how 
I have been living here in Canada for uh, five years, as you know. And uh, I think Canada is doing a very good uh, job regarding uh, all food security and trying to be very aware, aware about obesity. And But it's very impressive that you just cross the border no, to the U.S. and automatically you start seeing, I think, obviously it's the U.S. and Mexico, the ones that have the worst cases, but in the case of Mexico, obesity is in children. So that must uh, alarm people, uh, families and everybody, because obviously that, that will impact the health of the child, the health of, obviously of, the, of all the family. And uh, now we have seen with COVID-19 that our health systems have been strained due to the to this pandemic no and i'm worried uh, at least for what i read and what i see that we are attending COVID 19 but we are leaving uh, on the sites other other problems and uh, i think uh, the the issue of food security it's uh, left behind a little bit Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you another question. How does food sovereignty help small farmers and indigenous populations? How does it affect populations and the food we eat? Can you uh, explain us a little bit more about this? Uh, yeah, well, as I mentioned uh, some time ago, uh, it used to be the case until uh, the late 1980s that Mexico was mostly food self-sufficient. Uh, but once the liberalization started in 1988, particularly 1989, and that was in preparation for uh, making Mexico more attractive to NAFTA, you know, which eventually was signed and uh, it started in, in 1994. Uh, so, but, but the peasants, peasant economy, and that includes both mestizo and indigenous uh, peasantries, uh, they were producing mostly uh, basic foods for the domestic market. There were a few more capitalized farmers that were also engaged in the production of fruits and vegetables, some of which were for export. But uh, I would say that uh, it was mostly capitalized farmers that were producing fruits and vegetables because it's not as economically feasible for peasants to, to produce those because it is uh, more risky. And the logic of peasant production is not to maximize profit, but to minimize risk. And so the, the way they minimize risk is, uh, for instance, producing enough for their self consumption and then to sell uh, whatever surpluses they, they have. So. Uh, I think by supporting this kind of uh, economy, which is one thing that the current uh, government of Mexico is trying to do uh, through five, you know, supporting five different uh, food uh, items. Um, and that's uh, beans, corn, wheat, rice, and milk. I mean, Mexico currently is trying to recover food self-sufficiency in those uh, foods. Um, and I think uh, what happens more or less automatically is that uh, regional markets may become a little more vigorous, you know, because uh, another phenomenon that's happened since 1992 is the enormous growth of supermarkets in general, and particularly Walmart. I mean, Walmart was not even in Mexico in 1992. Now, Walmart, Mexico, produces, I understand, up to 20% of its global profits. So that gives an indication of how extremely successful Walmart has been in Mexico. Uh, I think to the detriment of regional peasant markets. And I mean, those were the markets that were producing the more, uh, you know, from your early definition of uh, but security, you mentioned adequacy, you know, cultural adequacy in particular. Well, now, you know, Walmart and all the other supermarkets have a lot of food there, but a lot of it is imported. And so it's not necessarily adequate in, term, in cultural terms. So Mexico has become a tremendous importer of 
uh, energy dense food. And by energy dense, I mean, because uh, you know, there are several, two kinds of energy density. You know, one would be, for instance, uh, pistachios, nuts, almonds. Those are dense in energy, but they're also nutritious. What I'm talking about here is the type of energy density that is mostly empty of nutrients. And I think there's a little too much of that in Mexico right now. And also in terms of uh, uh, fast food restaurants, uh, US chains. I mean, I, I went to a mall in Monterrey a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a new mall. And I was looking for a Mexican restaurant. I couldn't find one. It was all US chains. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, what used to be the very healthy Mexican food is not as available as it used to be. Yes, I totally agree. And uh, those are what we call also the empty calories, no? Easy calories, empty calories, obviously they have a lot of energy, but that is completely uh, damaging the health of, of people. So we need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the NAFTA, no? As you know, last year, uh, the, the Kuzma, because it has mm -hmm. different names in Mexico, we call it the MEC, in the US, mm -hmm. Kuzmac, and here it's Kuzma. Mm -hmm. Did you see any improvement regarding agriculture or the exchange in the new uh, NAF, in the new Kuzma that was signed and that entered into force last year? Uh, Are there more benefits yeah. for our people? I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, the the main change that I saw was uh, regarding the uh, the automobile industry, and the whole point was to increase the the rules of content. You know, from I think sixty two and a half percent to about 80 percent. You know? uh, meaning that eighty percent of the value of finished automobiles has to be produced in one of the three NAFTA countries. And there's another rule, which I can't remember the details, but it's uh, to the effect that uh, at least 50% of the cars must be produced in factories where the minimum wages are $16 an hour. So, uh, I mean, that was more or less the status quo at the moment when, when that was uh, introduced into the new new NAFTA, I'll call it that, you know, just for ease of, of the naming. Um, but uh, I guess the, the, the message was that uh, any future expansion of the automobile industry would have to be based on higher wages for Mexican workers. I mean, I think that's an extremely positive outcome uh, and it's not only related to, to Kuzma or Temec, uh, but also to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, because uh, that, that was uh, signed earlier. Uh, that's the one that uh, Donald Trump uh, took the United States out of on the first day of, of uh, his administration. Uh, so from 12 countries, only 11 were left. Mexico was one of them. And one of, one of the features of that uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership was that uh, uh, wages or, or unions, you know, workers in general would have greater rights. And I think Mexico really listened to that. And uh, in 2019, Mexico performed a major revision of its uh, labor laws. Uh, and in fact, I mean, it was, it was so important to all the Mexican politicians that that new labor law passed unanimously in 2019. Uh, so, and that's in part because, for instance, the, um, um, you know, the, the employer associations, you know, the chambers of commerce, the uh, Coparmex, for instance, you know, the, the uh, Mexican entrepreneurs, they were very worried about uh, Donald Trump's protectionism. And uh, I think Donald Trump, I mean, that's one of the very few things that I agreed with uh, with Donald Trump, that uh, Mexican wages were way too low. And uh, so in that sense, I think uh, 
Mexican politicians made the huge mistake of initially selling Mexico due to its low wages with the promise for Mexicans that Mexican wages would converge upwards toward US and Canadian levels. Well, that convergence never happened because Mexican wages were completely stagnant in, in relative terms to those of the United States and Canada, where, where uh, actually you know, wages continue to increase a little bit. Mind you, in my calculations based on Federal Reserve uh, Economic Database, the US uh, Federal Reserve Economic Database, my calculation uh, shows that uh, in all three countries, the share of labor from the uh, total income in each country actually declined. So the main winner of NAFTA has without a doubt been capital. Yeah, there was a, a blip in those data uh, during the Clinton year, the later, you know, late 1990s, where US workers actually did experience a bit of a, an increase in their income, but that ended in 2002. And I'm not sure to what extent, but it's very possible that that decline as of 2002 has something to do with the incorporation of China into the World uh, Trade Organization. Because I mean, that entry of China into the World Trade Organization automatically expanded uh, the labor force in the world, in the global economy, quite massively. And Mexico lost about 600,000 jobs in maquiladoras uh, initially because a lot of them you know, just were transferred to, to China. Yes, I think that, uh, well, I, I agree with you. I think that it was important updating the CUSMA or the new NAFTA, as you call it, no, uh, new chapters were included, like corruption, mm -hmm. property rights. The question of automotive obviously was what called them uh, most the, the, the attention. The other day I was reading that one piece, uh, uh, for example, before you have a, a complete car produced, uh, the exchange of pieces between the three, three countries can, can be around 800. No, so it's quite a, of the different pieces that are needed for a car. So that is how you see how we are part of the same uh, supply chains. And I right. think uh, things will change uh, now. We know that there are differences with China. No, we saw that the pandemic showed much more that you need to have uh, your supply chains need to be solid. No, and we are tending a little bit to more regionalisms. And in that, in that sense, I think Mexico, Canada, and the US will have a new opportunity, not only in the automotive uh, sector, but in other sectors, no? That, that I think that's important. Uh, you were, obviously, the, the wages are starting for the, for the people that work uh, producing the cars, but uh, I, I hope that that extends, no? Because it's a question of the unions, is that they need to be well paid, and well, we, we, I also, as Consul General of Mexico here in Canada, I see it with my temporary foreign workers. We have been discussing with authorities also that the, the and more now that they, they were designated as essential workers, that wages need to be increased, that security has to be better, that housing has to improve a, a lot. I can tell you because I have visited uh, since I arrived here, uh, 350 farms out of 550, and uh, the conditions and how workers are treated, there's bullying, there's harassment. Mm -hmm. So we are also expecting from the, from the provincial authorities and the federal government that also the rights of other workers in other sectors are considered in order to improve them. Because we're not asking anything different uh, than just applying the Canadian law and that all workers are treated as Canadian. No, it's not that we're asking for uh, subsidies or additional money for them. And, and I always see it as a win-win situation for all countries. No, in this context of economics, of a, a changing environment, people sometimes say 
that globalization is fading out. Maybe, in my opinion, yes, it's fading, it's, it's being transformed, but we still don't know or don't have the clarity where are we we head. Mm -hmm. Going back, Dr. Otero, to, 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 the, the, to the issue of food security, uh, I would like to, to, as you know, Mexico has adopted uh, recently laws no, for example, uh, Mexico's National Development Plan 2019-2024, the Sectoral Program for Agriculture and Rural Development 2020-2024, uh, and well, most recently, uh, the General Health Law, that the number is NOM 051, no, that was modified uh, trying to change the food level so people could be much more involved. And whenever you go to a supermarket or any place, you can see the level and decide for yourself if that's what you want, you want to take in order not only to have uh, empty calories or bad calories uh, that just provide energy without any kind of nutrients. So what's your opinion? Have, do you think the the this norm is working. Do you do you think that we need to improve maybe in the dissemination of the information? What uh, with the experience you have and uh, all the knowledge of all the, what other countries have been doing regarding obesity and uh, nutrition? What would you recommend uh, authorities or the civil society in order to be much more aware about what we eat? Okay. Uh, yes, I. Uh... Uh, I've seen the, the legislation and the labels and so on and so forth. And I think it's, uh, I mean, I have two, two main thoughts about that. The first one is that it's, it's a welcome change, but it's completely insufficient. That's my second one. Uh, why? Because, uh, I mean, it's welcome because uh, it will allow people who have uh, sufficient, sufficient education but especially sufficient means to make choices. See, one of the main arguments in, in my book is that uh, uh, I'm not saying that you know just because I, I happen to think so, but I mean, there are studies to the effect that education by itself will not lead to better uh, food choices. Why? Because food choices are dependent on accessibility. And it so happens that the most healthy food choices are not necessarily the most accessible. And so what that tells me is that uh, the people who already have the greatest access to healthy food, well, they will be better able to make better choices. But the people who have the medium to low incomes you know, even if they see that they're about to buy something that's really energy dense, et cetera, et cetera, well, maybe that's all they can buy. And so I think there, there are two ways of addressing that. On the one hand, you need to really change the food production system to alter the kinds of food that are being supplied to the population you know, to introduce tremendous disincentives for producing uh, junk food. I mean, to call it in a, in a very summarized way, right? Energy dense junk food. And the other major thing that needs to, to happen is to substantially reduce inequality. If you reduce inequality, increase people's level of income, then they will have a better choice then they will be able to read the labels and make better choices if they have the money to buy the better food. No, oh, that's very that's very interesting. Well, uh, I think we have taken a lot of your time, Dr. Otero. We really want to thank you for um, for sharing with us all your knowledge. I don't know if you have something else that you would like to add. Uh, well, I would like to just say that. Um, I am very pleased with uh, you know, some of the things that have been done in Mexico in the past couple of years uh, with regard to um, you know, trying to recover the food uh, self-sufficiency in some elements. Uh, but I think that a lot more needs to be done because Mexico continues to be a sort of dual 
production system. You know, on the one hand, there is this attempt at reinvigorating the production of basic foods by uh, the peasant uh, farmers. But on the other hand, Mexico continues to, uh, to depend on, on the production of food and vegetables for export. And uh, I mean, that is very intensive in water usage and not in the creation of much employment because uh, I mean, there is, there is employment. And so I guess another thing that would have to be done there is to really substantially increase the rights of farm workers in Mexico, not just here. And no, I'm I really happy. To, yeah, I totally I'm really happy to see what you're doing here. No, it's, I, mean, I yeah. totally agree with you that all the measures, policies that are adopted should first think in the people in their human yeah. rights. No, we have a lot to do. We, we know that uh, the sustainable development goals uh, of the United Nations are far away to reach. No, we were far, but we are more far uh, right now after the, the COVID-19. Okay. And there's a lot of things to do to protect people and to, to, to respect, their, respect and promote their, their human rights. Mm -hmm. Well, really, we want to thank you, Dr. Otero, for your time, for your knowledge. We really hope to, to continue to have this exchange with you because I'm sure that our authorities would be glad to know and benefit from your knowledge. And well, I invite everybody that is uh, accompanying us today to read his book, The Neoliberal Diet. I think there are a lot of concepts we, need, we, we really need to understand. No, uh, we really need to understand it's not only reading labels, as you were saying, we, need, we need to learn much more about availability, accessibility and adequacy of the food we eat. And I think that would be uh, good not only for, for, for the person or the family, but also for the health systems. No? And at the end, I think uh, when I lived in California, uh, I'm sure that the United States will have, and Mexico also, a huge, huge problem in health in no, no less than 10 years, nor because of obesity and other pro problems that are related. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Otero, and we hope to have uh, again the opportunity to talk to you again. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.